Hello, friends. Hi, everyone. Welcome Hi. to episode three of our uh, webinar series, Thriving at Junietta. Uh, really kind of targeting the parents and families of our incoming students to talk about transition issues and, uh, and campus. My name is Matthew Damshorter. I'm uh, the Dean of Students and Vice President for Student Life here at Junietta. Uh, and it's my pleasure to host you uh, here with us and along with uh, my co-host. Davion Clayton, second year engineering physics, uh, POE. I'm always, I always feel like saying major. It's okay, it's okay. because people understand the language of major. Okay. And you're just a tremendous student. I, uh, I'm blessed to sort of have uh, uh, my co-host. And we have our first guest uh, here with us. Hello, and I, everyone. Yeah, she's already breaking rules. We never start with We the never guest. start with the guest, but mm -hmm. uh, we didn't want to spare a moment without Dr. G or uh, Marita Gilbert, who is our uh, Dean of Institutional Equity and Inclusive Excellence. Absolutely. And uh, just a transformative and uh, fundamentally constructive person on our campus. Uh, helping to shift the culture towards inclusion and welcoming and belonging for all people and providing us with the resources and capacity to be able to do that work in the faculty, in the staff, and among our student bodies. We are blessed to have you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I want to thank all of our guests for being here with us today. I am so excited to be here with you all. So in full disclosure, um, I sort of prepared some things that I thought you'd ask me about. <laughs> Anyone that knows me knows that I will probably not speak about any of that. So, And I sent a bunch of questions that I promised I would ask, and anybody who knows me knows I promised I would ask those questions. Uh, and in part, that's oh, true yes. because, <laughs> uh, you, know, you know, to be fully honest and forthcoming, it has been a really challenging week on our yes. campus. Yes. It has been uh, a painful week earlier. Um, in, uh, in the week we lost one of our students, um, tragic uh, death, and, um, and our campus has been grieving the loss of, uh, mm -hmm. of our friend and our peer yeah. um, for the last couple of days. And it's been a challenging space, I think, stressful and difficult for students as it's reminded them, some of them, of experiences that they bring with them. And for others, it's a very new experience of loss that... Uh, that hits deeply. And, uh, and so as a community, we've been kind of responding to and attending to, uh, to the needs of our community. And, uh, and we've done that in, in multiple ways. Um, I'll share that, you know, for students who uh, have been identified or observed as, um, as being in distress or needing some additional help mm -hmm. or support, we've provided and made available crisis counselors and, uh, and, and grief counselors. We've had some opportunities for students in small groups as residence hall communities and, uh, and campus clubs and organizations to process and talk through, you know, some of the reactions and feelings and experiences that, that feel singular, but are really very normative. Uh, in, in a time of healing and loss. I got a lot of emails from, from professors just offering, you know, if it needed to be class time or after class time to talk about um, what a student was feeling or anything that they might have to process at the moment. They were very open to it. I think one of the things I have appreciated this week um, is that on our campus, we really took the time to come together um, and to have just that um, collective um, moment of grieving mm. and then also to kind of get back to what would help us feel normal. I think um, when you talked about coming together in smaller spaces, the Unity House has been kind of a respite for some of our students and then mm -hmm. some of our other community members that have just stopped in. And so um, I think Initially, it was the space when people felt like, I don't know where else to go, but I know I can go here, right? I think um, today I, I saw some of our students kind of trying to come back to themselves and mm. so um, trying to find moments of joy, right? And one of the best experiences I had today was walking, um, when I, as I was leaving, hearing laughter in the living room, right? And just that it was okay to kind of um, recover. 
recover um, individually and recover as a community. So um, it's it's been um, a challenging week. I think um, we're also learning, right, how to be resilient. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's an active lesson, right? Well, I've said, uh, you know, to kind of reflect on what you spoke about, it, it's okay not to be okay. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to be okay. It's mm -hmm. okay to find that space of community. It's okay to experience joy. It's okay to be positive. It's also okay to be sad. Yeah. And for each student, it's a bit of a different journey. It's a bit of a different timeline. Certainly the needs uh, are different. And so we're giving students the space um, to find their way and the resources uh, to be successful mm -hmm. as they need. Well, uh, you know, one of our reasons for inviting you mm -hmm. to be with us is to talk about the ways that students become. Mm -hmm. Because we bring our incoming students to campus as high schoolers, and, uh, and then we expect that they're college students. <laughs> and they have the skills and capacities to be successful. And uh, it doesn't quite happen that way, does it? <laughs> it's a growth process. It's a trajectory. And you talked a little bit about resilience. I did. What does that mean in, in the context of a collegiate environment? So I think it's being able to tap into some of the, the assets that each of us have already, right? Sometimes they lay a little dormant, right? But in moments of difficulty, being able to um, figure out not just how to overcome, but how to get through it, right? And how to get to be um, your best self afterwards, right? Mm. So the reason I describe it in that way is that it doesn't mean that every day is an easy day. Um, it doesn't mean that every day is the same, right? But it's a process of figuring out what do I need in this moment? Um, how do I want to be to get past this, right? Yeah. And yeah. then what do I need to do to get to that next space? Because I don't want to be stuck in the crisis moment, in the moment of difficulty, in the challenge space. But I want to be able to, to recover, right? Um, right. And I'm going to say be better, right? That doesn't mean... Um, that things are fixed, right? But that you're just in a different mindset or that you feel equipped to meet um, whatever you face in the day. Right? And I think, you know, to that end, you know, you say to be better. I think of it as, and anyone who knows me knows that this is just an illustration because yes. I would never lift weights. But, <laughs> uh, you know, people, you know, you do your 15 reps at three pounds. Mm -hmm. And then the next time you do 16 reps mm -hmm. because your muscles have that capacity to do 15 and then 17 or 20. And then you go to three and a quarter pounds, right? <laughs> they don't make weights. <laughs> so this is why this is funny. <laughs> because Matthew often jokes about having one ab. I have one ab. And, and it's weak. That's a stomach. And the avian used to play football. And so this conversation about weights increasing to three and a quarter pounds is really, you're doing well to hold it together. But it is about slowly <laughs> increasing capacity. Maybe a better metaphor would be, I could eat a cheeseburger today, but yes. tomorrow, one and a quarter. Now that, yes. Cheeseburgers. Makes sense. But it is about growing the ability to do more than next time. Many. You are not supposed to relate to cheeseburger metaphors. Why? Dr. G eats a lot. So, You're um, supposed to not be doing that. Anymore. I mean, the other, you know, not to take us away from cheeseburgers, okay. but the other, you know, kind of, I think, capacity around resilience is self-awareness and knowing how much is too much and when to reach out for help or assistance and um and and when a problem is solvable or, or when somebody else needs to step in and be an advocate and an ally yeah Good. yeah i needed to know myself a little more before i i would overwhelm myself and take taking on things where i feel like um like i don't need help i'm good mm -hmm. and then i end up needing help and i wasn't good and just being able to know myself and my own tendencies uh like i had to develop doing my homework since this semester I have classes every other day I have mm -hmm. Tuesday and Thursday off I couldn't allow myself to wait until the Tuesday and Thursday to do my Wednesday and Friday homework right. right so um 
like after class on Monday, I do my Wednesday homework. After Wednesday, I do my Friday. After mm-hmm. Friday, I do my weekend. And sometimes I'll do even more. But like just knowing how I am, because I'm too, just to cut out procrastination and to cut out laziness, because I'll have my day off on Tuesday and get to the, to about eight o'clock. And I'm like, damn, I have homework to do. Mm-hmm. And then I'll make the conscious decision to not do it. <laughs> so, so I, I, I think you're... Um... You're a great example, right, um, for students. But I also want to acknowledge that not all of our students show up in that way, right? Mm -hmm. So they are transitioning or they have to learn the lessons of what Mm -hmm. happens when you wait till the last minute to do it or what happens if you don't pace yourself, right? And so um, when we think about student development, right, um, there is that transition that happens physically being in a different space. Mm -hmm. There's the transition that happens kind of emotionally and, and academically. And then there's also some transition that happens socially and balancing all of those, right? In your first year and in your first semester. Um, I, I like to think of it as an individual experience because no two students will have the same experience. No right. two students will have the same journey. Yeah. And so it doesn't look the same um, for any it's unclear what we bring <laughs> into the space with us and the experiences that we have have helped shape us or you know build capacity or or not and and so to that end i think really every student's kind of finding out what they assets that they bring and then what mm-hmm. sort of assistance they need um you know to your point i think the other piece of it is that you know, uh, students need those basic fundamental, you know, um, needs fulfilled, right? Yes. They need to have food and housing. They need to feel safe mm-hmm. and secure. Yeah. And that's both physically and mentally safe and secure in the right. learning environment before they can sort of step up and do that higher level work of learning and engaging and being challenged and supported. And, Um, And in instances where those basic needs are threatened, it's our responsibility as an institution or as a college to help shore up and uh, and provide some stability. So one of the things um, when you asked me to stop by today and share with you all, you asked me to talk a little bit about student development um, in terms of theory, Mm -hmm. which I always think is funny um, because I'm the most, I'm the least likely doctor, right? The least likely PhD. Um, But as you were talking about, you know, the needs that we have. So Terrell Strayhorn talks um, specifically about this need to to feel like you belong Mm -hmm. on campus, right? Um, And his framework is really looking at um, some of the most marginalized or underrepresented students. And so his research talks about the fact that if students feel that they belong on their campus, and if there's an early established sense of belonging, there are higher rates of retention, of persistence, of student success, and eventually graduation. And so um, Diavion, for me, is a great um, example of that uh, because I think, um, wait, although you asked me to, to talk about it theoretically, some of my work actually happens quite practically sure. right, when I show up every day. And so I think back to when you first got to campus, right? So there was one person that you knew that was kind of a resource or is a resource for you. Um, But some of the things that we did for the AVN and that we do for many first generation students um, is really trying to make sure that they have established relationships Mm -hmm. on campus with campus partners, whether they're faculty, whether they're staff, administrators, um, so that they can easily identify, this is my person. If I have a question, if I'm confused about something, if I... Um, I'm unclear if there's something that I'd like to pursue. Um, And so even at the end of your first year, when we had some moments of difficulty, right, um, I think it was easier to have that reset Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. the resources, you had already established those relationships, right? And so, um, you know, when we talked about that resilience, right, being able to figure out how to move through it and then kind of recover um, and then get back to the place where you could be successful. And so here we are in the second year, the Avian is here, right? Um, And in terms of identity formation, has been been able to clearly um, determine for himself 
for yourself who you want to be. Um, and that was a different student than mm -hmm. who you were when you um, showed up. And I don't know if you want to share that a little bit. Of that. Well, the hard time that I was going through was <clears throat> just less uh, getting accustomed to school, but more um, like cl the classes that I was taking. More specifically, calculus was mm -hmm. having its way with me. <laughs> and I've never had a class treat me so poorly as calculus did. Mm. And it was just something to get over to get. It didn't to... respect your limits. It, it really didn't. It really <laughs> didn't. And I didn't appreciate that. But just having, like my, um, uh, what's the term? My uh, advisor. Well, they they you guys were my. Um, oh, like your circle, advisors. your network. Yeah, my network of people and just my um, people that I can go to and just ventilate and just. Um, you know, speak on how I was feeling and get off my chest, um, my issues with the class and just talk through it because I was always given solutions to a lot of my problems. Mm -hmm. When I came to see you or or TJ or Tasia, I was always talk through whatever situation I was in. And that helped a lot um, because I may have already had an idea of what to do, but hadn't thought of all the details or mm -hmm. the day to day, how I should go about it. And those were the the details and um, solutions that you guys gave me. So knowing a lot of people uh, has helped me um, exhibit A, exhibit B. <laughs> but that's exhibit a, that's a process. I mean, yeah. I, I think for a lot of students, building that trust and finding those willing partners can be intimidating, mm -hmm. especially for students who feel anxiety around mm -hmm. relationship building or who feel like, you know, going into their advisor's office is uh, is a challenge. It's, it's definitely hard to open up like that because um, if it wasn't, because for me it was easier because the first time that I, I met you was a, a football meeting that we were having in NEF and, and VLB. Um, and I'm sitting there with my, my roommate, Joe, and he knew, he knew her, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. So... I'm just sitting there listening to her as she's talking to addressing the team. I'm like, she, she comes off as a mom to me, and she she closely related my or a mom big sister. <laughs> yeah, I can be a mom. It's okay, I'm a mom. I'm a big brother. I'm a big brother. Go ahead. But um, yeah, it's, you just reminded me of my mom. It was very maternal and nurturing how you were talking, but also how you swifted. Swift, switched uh -huh. your uh your gears to like a scary face oh like you got stern that can happen mm -hmm. you you went you went from from joking to stern very fast and you semi scared me well but, so some of that though right as we we're talking about the no you didn't scare me away yeah but we're talking about the difficulty of establishing relationships or how is it that people make that transition Sometimes, you know, it's individual by individual, right? Mm -hmm. Or as you're talking about one particular experience. Um, and for each person, it'll be different. What resonated for you was, oh, she's very lo loving. And also she will probably kill me, just yeah. like my mom. Or at least kick me in the butt. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and for other people, you know, it could be, this is someone that challenges me in a different way or challenges me to think about myself in a different way or um, is so different than anything else that I've ever encountered. But there's something about that that I like, right? Um, or the experience of um, that, inter that interaction or that exchange, you know, really pushed me to want to know them more mm -hmm. or um, get to know them more, spend more time in that discipline because they're in that discipline. And so I think all of that... Um, is a part of that transition, right? And, and it's a process of leaning in. Yes. And I think that that can be challenging for students. What are some tips or advice you might give to a student who sees the potential in a faculty or a staff mm -hmm. member, but is a little bit worried about the process of leaning in to that relationship? Um, just as like the sociable introvert that I am, I don't often like to express myself uh -huh. but when necessary to hold a conversation i can and so when i hold that conversation i i notice the notice things about the person that i'm speaking to so even if um you're thinking about 
um, speaking to a specific staff member um, about something that's that you're dealing with, or even if you just want to hold a conversation with the person to see what kind of person they are and just make a, a new connection. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you don't have to talk about yourself per se, just say hi. More, more than likely the people around here will start holding that conversation for you. Mm -hmm. And you just pick up on um, whatever um, little things about the person that you can and make your decision after that conversation. It doesn't have to be on the spot and it could, doesn't have to be one conversation. It could be multiple um, highs and buys and passing and just get a feel of that person's mm -hmm. energy. How do they react when they see you? Things like that, because I feel as though when people are happy to see me, it makes me feel better and it makes mm -hmm. me more likely to want to talk to them so I can be happier. Sure. So, yeah. So just say hi, hold a conversation. It doesn't have to be just opening up your all of yourself to another person at all times. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be like that at all. Well, if you have questions or want to engage with us, certainly use the chat function of the, the webinar. We, of course, welcome your comments and thoughts and input. And, uh, you know, I, I, I guess, you know, the other piece about belonging mm -hmm. is finding space. You can find people, but you also yeah. have to find space. And you talked a little bit about the Unity Houses mm -hmm. uh, as a place on campus where students find community. The spot mm -hmm. seems to be another location on campus where people find their people yeah um i think one of the first places that i always suggest is the quest office mm -hmm. um, because it really is our space or our vehicle for student success um it's also the place where like you will have different touch points right so first year experience or um uh, with our tutoring program also as you're thinking about summer employment um, and even some of our internships, mm -hmm. right? The, mm -hmm. um, Tammy, who is the director of our um, career development um, area, really challenges our students to think about themselves as professionals, even if in that moment they're not quite at that, right. that space, right? right? And then pushing them sometimes to take some of those um, opportunities that they hadn't considered before. I think um, also as you know, we connect more with high-impact practices like faculty mentored research, right? Um, and helping students really identify faculty members who are looking for students to partner with or um, who have some uh, research availability. I think uh, another space that I think about a lot of times is uh, the space that students are in most and that's in their residence halls mm -hmm. and really making strong relationships with your RAs, um, mm -hmm. with your RLCs, um, because I think even um, when there was a loss in your family, the residents' life staff were the first folks to alert me, right? To be able to say, hey, I think you really need to come check on Diavia, right? Um, and so I think it's also a space because a lot of dialogue happens there, right? It's a space where students can be brave, but they can also be challenged, right? To think about things um, perhaps in ways that they haven't previously. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's the the, the close proximity of space, yeah. right? Um, so it's a little harder to run away. These are the people that you see all the time. And so um, to that end, helping you to have a more robust dialogue. But I also think in terms of support, right? So, um, you know, maybe that you and I have gone home for the evening, but those are the folks that will see you and say, hey, are you okay? Yeah. Are you feeling okay? Would you would you like for me to go pick something up um, from the dining hall and bring it back for you? And so, I think those are some of those initial spaces um, that lead to that kind of sense of belonging. I also think, honestly, and I, I encourage students always to spend time in their faculty members' offices. Absolutely. Right. So going to office hours so that your faculty can get to know the things um, that interest you the things that you'd like to do professionally. And then they're able to suggest opportunities like internships, like connecting you to um, some of our employment opportunities or getting you to consider things like graduate school. Yes. Um, and so I think that's another one of and, those spaces. And what's need. interesting, I think, you know, some students, especially those who are new to campus or don't have a framework for higher education, don't understand about the public-private nature of those spaces. Yes. And so... 
our faculty spaces, you know, typically faculty's individual offices are clustered around sort of a suite Mm -hmm. that has some comfortable furniture and maybe a table and chairs. And it is very common for students who either have a class or are in the POE that, you know, is, is within the discipline to gather between classes in yes. that in that common area where interactions take place and, you know, di- different, those are situated differently, kind of based on the culture of the discipline. Some mm-hmm. will have coffee, some will have, you know, food. Those would be the ones I would go to, <laughs> um, you know, but, and faculty walk in or they walk out and there's informal kind mm-hmm. of contact that takes place Very and community cool. development. I and feel like, almost remiss if I don't say that the Dean of Students we have the same sweet. thing, you know, um, this week. Also a place. It's lovely to come in and, you know, I'll find a student studying or a couple students studying mm-hmm. in the in the chairs in the Dean of Students office. And that's... I, often, I often just pop up in these offices just to bother people in the best way possible. <laughs> and it's not a bother, right? right that's like, that is the beauty of being, uh, you know, fully present and mm-hmm. engaged mm-hmm. in the community. I usually make them crack a smile or give them a hug. They, they, they often don't get hugs around here, so I, I'm well, the one to give it to them. We hug with open arms. That's right. Otherwise, it's creepy. <laughs> uh, on that note. I know. I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> also, I know that I'm only one of the guests for today. Yeah, um, right. But the reason I kind of wanted to say that the Dean of Students um, Suite is one of those spaces is because there are many de- de- deans and we have different foci. Right. Um, but I do think that your next guests are excellent examples of folks who are not just here to do the the work of the college, but also really getting to know students, mm-hmm. getting to know how best to support them um, as they are becoming. Right. And all of us are continually becoming. Right. And so um, connecting students to the resources to help them to be who it is that you're striving to become. And so. Um, I think that our deans are wonderful advocates and allies for students and connectors to both resources and opportunity. And the ally. <laughs> well, we are blessed to have you among us. I'm and, so happy uh, to be here with you, too. Thank you for sharing perspective and thoughts, thoughts with us tonight. Well, thank you to all my guests. My guest. Thank and you I, all. And it, it's as if you're departing, but in a half an hour we'll be I know. together upstairs know. in a meeting for a, <laughs> a cultural a learning tour. We do, we do. Yeah, all right, so I'm going to pass it off. Okay. Yeah. The next one. Thank you so much for Thank having you much. me. And, uh, and to that end, we'll be inviting uh, two of our additional deans. Oh, yeah, we got uh, space. Dean Cook Huffman and, uh, and Dean Tasia White to join us. Come on in. <laughs> We're low budget. We're low tech. Yeah, Dan is low. <laughs> well, uh, I know, right? Like, <laughs> I feel like we should go to commercial break, but in fact, <laughs> so no we don't have a commercial break. So we, we squeeze in. We get comfortable here in, uh, squeeze in. in the studio. It's my pleasure uh, to welcome. Yeah, okay, there I am. I could just, anyway, there you, go. you are kind of on the edge. Yeah, it's know. my uh, pleasure to welcome uh, Dean Tasia White and Dean uh, Dan Cook Hoffman yeah, fix this to join us. We could maybe move a little bit there. There we, there we go. Better. Okay. There it is. <laughs> I'll lean on you, Ms. Uh As fellow deans, uh, Dean uh, Cook Huffman, Dan, and uh, and Dean uh, White Tasia join me here in the suite uh, on a daily basis, and we share um, responsibilities for following up with students, but uh, and and so coordinating um, issues of advocacy, helping students solve problems, helping them find their way through challenges, um, is the work that we do, and it's good work and it's powerful work and thank you for the efforts that you make on the behalf of students. Uh, I'm curious, you know, as we introduce you, what brought you um, into this role? How did you get to be a a Dean of Students? That's a good question. So, um, well, I've been doing this now for 22 years here at Judietta and I started actually on a faculty track. I uh, did that for a number of years, and then there was something missing about that, and uh, an opportunity opened um, as the assistant dean of students here, and uh, so 
That's how I started. Was it the uh, interaction for day by day? Yeah, yeah the interaction, step. the work with students. I I still think of the work we do as very educational, but it's not like classroom based. It's yeah, it's okay. more uh, you know just interpersonal work and development, and I really like it. So that's how I got into it. Cool. Um, so I'm a Juniata alum, and um, when I left here as a student, I always dreamt of coming back and had the opportunity to do so when um, the director of residential life position opened. Um, and then after a few years, um, this opportunity as assistant <coughs> dean um, came about. And so for me, this is a new role, and so I'm still learning about what it means to be an assistant dean. But so far, so good. <laughs> well, definitely, you know, the work is um, is helping students solve problems. And, and sometimes on tours, when uh, our tour guides bring families through, you know, what I've encouraged them to say is the dean of students office is the place you go when you don't know where to go uh, or who to ask or, uh, or where to find support. Um, can, can you talk maybe, Dan, a little bit about some of the issues that might bring a student into the, dean, the dean's office? Yeah, sure. Um, well, every day there, there are probably at least a couple dozen students who stop in. And of course, that's between the appointments that we have with students ongoing as well. But um, it, there's a whole host of things that students come into our office for. As we, as Matthew probably said earlier, the Dean of Students Office is kind of a hub and people sort of cross campus sort of direct students to us as a place to find resources and to get connected and to get their questions answered. So things as simple as, you know, where's this office or where's this faculty member or how do you uh, register for a class or how do you drop a class or how do you pick a new advisor uh, to, you know, I'm having a roommate issue or uh, a relationship problem or there's an issue at home, maybe a family pet is sick or a family member has died or there's transportation issues. Um, you know, sometimes it's also about uh, kind, of, kind of figuring out their path uh, in this environment on this campus their academic uh choices and what they really want to be you know sort of when they grow up um so we do a lot of we spend a lot of time just working with students on all kinds of things about you know who they're becoming and our framework is to try to always appeal to their best selves and to help them you know set their own path yeah. and, and become the, the best they can be yeah it's about making sure i think and we talked a little bit with Dr. G about, you know, that challenge and support and making sure that the challenges that students encounter are met with support sufficient to their resolution. And different students can manage a different <coughs> level of challenge or need a different level of support. And some of the work, I think, and refined practice that, uh, that we are asked to bring to the table is helping to determine when that student reaches a point, you know, that exceeds their grasp. Mm -hmm. And then how, how we fill in that gap with resources. And, you know, some of that, Tasia, I think, gets honed in housing. Yes. <laughs> Where <laughs> students can be in distress with a roommate or feel uncomfortable and, uh, and need some solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're well prepared for this work. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the other kind of, I think, opportunity that we have is to help craft, you know, programming and experiences. And Dan, you acknowledge that they're educational, that our faculty really do an instruction and help to educate <coughs> our students, but our staff equally help to educate students. And, and Tasia, some of the work that you're doing now is related to pro-social education of, of students around health and wellness. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, some of some of that work and its importance in, in this space? Sure. So something that we have identified as a health and wellness team are just different um, areas that we felt like students needed to get a little extra help, a little extra support um, in terms of having a more healthy lifestyle. Um, you know, being in this stressful environment, you know, students may forget some of those healthy habits that they had at home. And so for us, it's really about reminding them about what those healthy habits are or what they could be, you know, if it's something that maybe is a new skill or a new habit that they're trying to add. And so they range from, you know, how to manage stress um, to how to prepare for winter, how do I handle difficult relationships. So really trying to pull things from many different angles mm -hmm. um, that we felt like students would be um, 
better equipped to handle if they had these different resources available? Yeah, I think I think giving students the skills to be able to manage their lives at a different level is a big part of of the work that we do. Mm -hmm. So, Absolutely. you know the you know the other piece that's made even more salient by this week is that we help students in crisis. We help students in distress, and uh, and a lot of that is <coughs> sort of one on one work. Uh, and and we have this sort of notice of concern system. Dan, can you talk a little bit about that system and sort of how others contribute their observations and then what are our response protocols sure. when, when a student's identified as needing I'll, assistance? I'll broaden that just a little bit and talk particularly about first year students and you know, so the framework when we think about them coming to campus, a lot of them share sort of common elements. They're all first year, they're all new to this place. They are all, you know, looking for friends and navigating, uh, perhaps for the first time, a roommate experience, um, figuring out, you know, their health needs around diet and exercise and sleep mm. and all those things. Those are the common things they all have. And then each of them also brings unique things that are part of their family history, perhaps their cultural history. Um, you know, we have international students and students from across the country. Um, their religious experiences and history, um, you know, their family dynamics, um, and perhaps their challenges that they might have, both the things they exceed and excel in, in their academic work and the things that they're, where they're really challenged in new ways, um, or even in old ways that they've, they've struggled with, you know, all along through, through their educational experience. So, so we, we have different ways and the notice of concern is one of those to really capture and and identify those both mm -hmm. those common experiences that all new students have but also the unique pieces to their own story and their life and trying to find ways to connect them to resources and to to help them you know with their own self-efficacy and, and their own empowerment to to really navigate things successfully so um, the notice of concern system for example is a it's an online form um, that parents and um, off-campus um, parties who are interested in, in students also can complete um, anonymously or not. And it is designed to bring to our attention, you know, concern that someone mm -hmm. might have. It could be a roommate, a floor mate, a resident assistant, a faculty member, a parent. Um, and we follow up on those, each and every one, and uh, ask the student to come in for a meeting and uh, just sort of express the concern and try to find ways to help them mm. to navigate that concern and to, to find the resources they need and to hopefully get over the difficulties that that concern might might represent so yeah well some of that sort of problem solving and kind of emergent dialogue is about resources and expanding you know the reach that students maybe have taken advantage of and Tasia, i know that you know a lot of resources having been a student here how, how do you encourage a student or maybe assess their willingness to be able to take advantage of particular solutions and and craft a, a plan forward well i think the the biggest challenge for many of our stu new students in particular is you know asking the question of what resources are available and so we do try to make you know, that information known even while they're coming in as a first year student, um, at least trying to get them connected with that one person from that area so that they could have, you know, a name that maybe they can um, reach out to. Um, and then really it's through our um, programmatic efforts that we, you know, draw more students in. So as we're doing things to bring awareness about, you know, um, different departments, for example, the um, Glacier Center for Counseling, they do count, um, programming for the campus um, to let students know that they are a resource for them um, because some students may be apprehensive about going to the Glacier Center. And so, you know, that's just one way that we could, you know, that we do some outreach um, to at least get students interested and give them an idea of who's there and then hopefully it will help them get more comfortable with um, entering that space. I think the other, you know, the other piece that sort of builds on both of those is the follow-up. And I think that's, you know, the other, you know, leg of the stool. Uh, that, you know, that we engage in is sort of making sure that, you know, if we've articulated a plan 
with that student, then checking back in to see, did you go to see your faculty member? Did you follow through on that test and how did it go? Did you meet with a counselor to kind of check out and, um, and explore some resources or capacity development? And for us, I think that that's both affirming because sometimes we get to see students then making progress and, and finding their firmer footing. It can also help us identify students who maybe need a little bit more help yes. or support. Yeah, Tasia and Dr. G are very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> like I personally, I'll like I have a friend, and um, she's playing a sport, and she she like got hurt, and so she we were talking about for most of most of the day, um, like what ailed her and uh, what she's been doing to alleviate the pain and stuff. And so I'll take all that in, and then the next time I see her, I'll completely for, forget about that conversation, and I won't ask how how she's feeling. But I'm still, like, it, I don't feel as though I don't care. It's just, like, I just don't remember. And I'll talk to you or Dr. G, <laughs> like, two weeks ago, and then I come back to see I come back to see you today or tomorrow, and you'll immediately ask so how'd it go um, uh, and then i'll forget like how did what go <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I i never i never quite remember uh what i'm supposed to remember but you guys always always remember what i was supposed to be doing what <laughs> what i needed to uh get done what i need to talk to someone for who i need to see you guys are good at that well yeah, I like to think of I like to yeah. think of the work we do. I like to think of dean, the title dean, as being equivalent to friend, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and and there are different roles for friends. Sometimes you're a friend who's a little like a parent, really guiding and directing, and maybe giving more intervention. Sometimes you're just a friend, um, you know, holding someone accountable in some way, or asking a difficult question, or uh, or sometimes you're just there as a friend who someone needs a shoulder to cry on or someone is really frustrated about some experience they've had or some challenge they're facing they just need someone to listen and to be there so i think um it sounds kind of quaint in a way but i think a lot of the core of what we do is just trying to be friends to students do you feel like that's a perception on campus i mean i i wonder sometimes if students think oh it's the principal's office or oh people yeah only, there's some of that people <laughs> only get called there when they're in trouble <laughs> I always thought that deans were scary, but that was that was based off, um, you know, elementary school and high school. Never wanted to go see the deans, but that was only until I made friends with Dr. G last last year, and she turned out to be a dean. And then <laughs> each time I came into the office, all the deans, because like you walk into the dean's office, it's first like their living room with all the couches that they mentioned. And then all their offices surround it. So whenever I walk in, if a door is open, I'll just say hi. And they're always so nice whenever they see me. So I'm like, they're not so scary. This isn't too, this isn't too bad. So um, yeah, the, the deans here are nothing like the, the stigma of deans that they had put on them in um, lower education levels. Well, there is some truth to the fact that we do address student misconduct. Yeah, and we have to sort of set boundaries with okay. students. And Dan, I think that's particularly challenging work to do that in a space that's educational and restorative. Can you talk a little bit about how to we achieve that balance? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, Judiana, it, the perception from the, the data we have, the polling data or the survey data rather that we have uh, of students even, is that Judiata is a really safe, warm, welcoming, supportive community. But we also are a normal place and so there is misconduct you know some students choose to drink when they're not 21 or drink too much or um, harass someone or bully someone or break something intentionally or steal something or you know i mean th those things happen um, but our approach very much is not to be punitive uh, and not to be um, uh, you know sort of looking to get someone and you know sort of hold them accountable in a in a way that shames them or something. Instead, it's to look at those moments as developmental moments, as educational moments, and as times when we can, you know, again, 
appeal to their best sense, help them become their, their best self. So we often will say to students, you know, is that, is that really who you want to be? I mean, who, who do you want to be in this circumstance, in this situation? And often they reflect on that and think, yeah, I, I think I really want to apologize or mm. I want to find a way to make that better, to actually bring about some recovery and healing for someone, someone because I've damaged their property or whatever it might be. Um, so it's a, it's a great place. You know, we don't have a lot of um, serious you know, criminal behavior or bad behaviors, if you will. But, um, but we do have some things that happen and that's our approach, you know, a little bit like a, like I imagine most families would have most parents, you know, you don't want to send your child to jail or something, but you certainly, or to punch them, you know, sort of partially, but you definitely want them to learn from their mistake and their situation and figure out how they, you know, a path forward so that they can both, you know, forgive themselves and reestablish their uh, good standing in the community and move on. It's about fostering citizenship, I think, yeah. and helping students understand their character. That sort of proactive duty that they have to be good, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. To be ethical. Think about who you are. <laughs> and then evolve an act, right, Deja? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's feuding mottos. Yeah. <laughs> feuding, uh, feuding college mottos between, uh, between cohorts of students. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, one one of the things that uh, my parents don't understand is that I'm not a student. <laughs> I think they still think that I'm just in college and have not been successful in graduating. <laughs> um, and so to that end, I think, you know, deans of students have a lot of expertise about how to be a successful student. You know, what advice would you offer you know, both to students and then to parents as they help kind of shape an experience for students uh, in, in being successful and effective. Mm. I didn't prepare them for this question at all. I'm just like, <laughs> throwing it out. Well, I'm happy Look to... at you. You're yes. like, oh, I feel like I walked in the room and, and they gave me a test. <laughs> Pop quiz. I'm never prepared for anything. I don't. I don't get a. That like, is such a lie. Yeah. <laughs> that is such a lie. Yeah. Uh. I really just come in here and just do my thing. I just say things. So I'll I'll take a quick shot at that question. I think um, we really think of parents, for example, as partners with us in the work we do with with your students, um, and we welcome your your involvement. You know. Um, in a measured way. I mean, there are sometimes parents who are probably over involved in a, a little bit or, um, you know, in ways that doesn't really help to develop independence and, and agency for students. Um, so sometimes we have to have conversations with parents um, about that as well. But we really welcome parents to share their concerns. And as I mentioned before, you can use that notice of concern form that's on our website. Mm-hmm. Um, you could also pick up the phone and call us or email us. All of our contact information is on our website. Um, and, uh, we, you know, we welcome your insights and your concerns. And, and we like working with you to, to help figure out, you know, the best way forward for your student. After all, you, you know them better than we do. You've, you've had them at home for 18 years, right? right. right. And so your insights and uh, wisdom about your student can really help us. And we can partner together and to transform your student, have the stu- this experience be a transformative one for them. I'd say teach your child how to be grown. <laughs> send, them, <laughs> send them here knowing how to take care of themselves. So they can stop breaking the washing machines because y'all know how to wash clothes. <laughs> teach your kids how to wash their clothes. Yeah. I don't know that everyone knows how to wash clothes. I yeah. can't, That's just... She couldn't find the button that said start on it. <laughs> Is there a button that says start? I yeah. thought it was a yes. knob you had to pull her from. That's oh. for that's for the that's the dryer. The dryer, you turn it to the time and you push it. I guess I'm old school. Oh, <laughs> they don't know how to wash their clothes. Mm-hmm. It makes me very sad. And you know, that's just that's been an ongoing thing. That you know, that's just something many students, you know, they're learning for the first time how to be independent, and so that's part of that college experience. You know, for some people, they're lucky enough to start college with having those skills, which. I'm sure you're one of them. I mean, I just feel like it's a, it's something to learn before you're 18 and leave. I, actually, I remember the invention of Febreze, which became yeah. a substitute for laundry. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> no. 
boy. Don't so, raise a Mac, okay? <laughs> Don't wash your clothes. I'm just saying, there's an ease to it. <laughs> so when I think about advice for a student, um, I think about having that balance of being involved, but not too involved. Because I think it's good to come to college for more than just uh, the academics or more than just being in the classroom. It's really about having those opportunities to build leadership, to understand problem solving. Um, and so trying to find that balance of doing well academically, but then also getting involved as a student. I know that's something that my first two years, I did not do a very good job of. I was an RA my sophomore year and had maybe one or two clubs and that was it. And it wasn't until my junior year that I really felt like I was missing out on something as a mm -hmm. student. And so I got involved with JAB and, mm -hmm. you know, partook in um, some other like larger events on campus and really felt like that helped to shape me and really drive me into this profession. Yeah. Well, Dan, I'm going to press you a little bit further because okay. you have kids in college. I do. One I currently. One, I have here, one here at UD right now. <laughs> who's a delight, um, you know, and, and you've had students <laughs> Closer to home, you've had students farther from home. You know, what did you have to learn as the parent of a college student yeah. to be successful and for your students to be successful? Well, the first thing I had to learn, I'll, I'll tell a very quick story. When we dropped my son, I have an older son and a younger daughter, five years apart. Uh, the daughter's here at Junietta, sophomore now. <clears throat> when we dropped our son off um, at a college not far from here, five years ago, whatever it was, um, we cried all the way home, nonstop, mm -hmm. literally. And then when I got home, I sent him a text right away and he didn't respond. Mm -hmm. And then I sent him one a little later that night and he didn't respond. Heartbreak. And it was about a week before he responded at all. And when he did finally, he said, dad, I knew it was going to be really hard for you. And so I intentionally, <laughs> you know, like for you to let go a little bit. Oh, like, wow. So I intentionally just didn't communicate with you for a week. And then after that, I learned to back off a little bit to give him the space. And he voluntarily communicated with me a little bit more. You know? mm -hmm. So we kind of found a nice balance. So he taught me a good lesson. There. It wasn't my wisdom. Kind of in a his, cruel way. It was, but... his, it was a little cruel. But but no, um, now my daughter's a very different story. She stops by the office all the time. And, she does. Runs in and hugs me, you know, and, and so uh, it's a different, different thing. But, little um, girl. She's a little, a little, little bit, yeah. She's she's really great. I wouldn't but, say that. Uh, no, I know. No, she's and yeah, strong minded, she's very, actually. Yeah, but not, a, I yeah, I have no control for there, but uh, I don't want it either. But um, <laughs> no, but in terms of you know, it, what I would say is that it, the process of having your student go away to school, or even have them on your own campus, in my case. Um, it's one that's a two-way street in terms of the learning. Like, they still need you, but they need you differently now. And so you as a parent have to learn your changing role from more of parent-child to more friend-friend or, you know, equals and, and kind of partners. And so um, oh, that's exciting. Too, that's exciting work, <laughs> but it's also a little difficult at first. And it's a challenge for parents, but that would be my piece of my little tidbit of wisdom or advice. So it's a, it's a learning process for parents too. And you have to learn to let go a little bit. Well, this, this team is a tremendous uh, team to work with. And Aaron Paschal, who you've met in, uh, in past episodes, <laughs> rounds out our group and uh, is also one of our assistant deans and just uh, a blessing. But I will say it is a joy to work with you. The talents that you bring are immense in service of our students. And I know it's a lot to give. Um, there are jobs and there are vocations. And my hope is that students find their calling and their passion and a way to do that meaningful work. Um, and so I thank you for your efforts on behalf of students. And when I think about the Dean of Students role, I'm, I'm always drawn to the poetry of Marge Piercy, and you've heard me say this before, but one of those um, really powerful poems for me sort of ends, you know, with the metaphor that the pitcher yearns for water to carry and the person for work that is real. And the work that we're privileged to do in this office, in this space is real, uh, mm -hmm. and it's powerful. 
and um, and it's a pleasure. And so thank you for being thank here you. tonight and, and for the work that you do. And uh, oh, look at that, <laughs> high fives. <laughs> oh, wow, that's very sporty. Yes. Um, and and with that, I think that's a good place for us to sign off. So okay. good night, if, everyone. If you thank have you. questions, uh, again, we invite you to reach out to us, Dean of Students at Junietta. Uh, .edu um, or uh, in our comments, or uh, we have the uh, parents Facebook group, the class of 2022 Facebook group, three, three Facebook three. group. Uh, and so you can search for that and, uh, and join or add in to that as well. But thank you very much for spending this time with us and, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Good night.